Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm your host and the co-author of the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, Dr. Rebecca Bernard. We are being joined by today's guest, one of the lead authors of a brand new study on the impact of non-physician practitioners on physician trainees. Dr. Andrew Phillips, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself and what what got you interested in this research? I have a survey background. That's most of what I do. And uh, I have a a book on survey methods, and that's my area of expertise. This came to me because uh, I actually have a colleague who had this idea and wanted to pursue this research, but was threatened with termination if this person pursued the topic. This was not something that I was particularly leaning towards until I heard that. And that bothered me terribly. And I believe firmly, I think a lot of us do, that we should be able to have an open conversation about research. We should be able to research any topic. It's a very, very politically charged topic. And it's unfortunate because unless you can research something and talk about it, you're, you're not going to, you sure can't answer the tough questions until you can ask them. And so that was important to me, to be able to at least ask the question. So I, I found some other colleagues, in fact, some outside of emergency medicine, because it was so difficult to find anybody willing to even ask the question. And we put this together and we went to, to great lengths to make it something that was uh, as unbiased as possible. I, I am a physician uh, and I'm, you know, I'm putting this together, but we sent it around to multiple individuals, including non-physicians, other survey experts, trying to make sure that the language was just as down the middle of the road as possible. And we wanted the chips to fall wherever they were. Uh, the residents could have said things were great. They learned a lot. Uh, they could say that things were problematic. We just, we wanted to let it be where it was. And that's, that's where this landed us. Let's just start out by talking to our audience about what this study was, what it looked at and what the outcomes were. This study looked at what was the resident perspective of having NPs and PAs in the emergency department. And then we stratified that as well by programs that have a postgraduate program for NPs and PAs. And this is in emergency medicine specifically. Tell us what the actual results of the study were. Right off the bat on the Likert style questions, 67% reported, if this is of the residents, that NPPs had a detracting or greatly detracting impact on their overall education. And just to give a sense, the scale was exactly mirrored. So we just asked, what is the impact of having NPPs in your emergency department during your training? And they could say it greatly helped. It helped some, and then there was neutral, and then uh, greatly detract or detracting. So the item was available for them to say, this is fantastic. We learn a ton from them. They're super helpful, but that's not where things generally laid out. One of the other points that we talked about was the workload. And in the surgical literature, they talk about the benefits of having NPPs on the service because it reduces workload. But surgery is very different from emergency medicine in that, sure, if you're able to have someone else other than the residents handling the general pages on the floor, patient X needs Tylenol and patient Y needs uh, some other sort of pain medicine, whatever, the, the random pages that come during the day, all the physicians will know exactly what I'm talking about then sure, right? You have a little more time in the OR and that makes some sense. Although they also report the little bit of the the counter to that is it means to get less education on the floor, right? Uh, but emergency medicine is different. And so here the workload was not really uh, impacted. About 45% said that some of the workload uh, was a little bit lighter, but it did not make a big difference on their charting and those things that helped with surgery. One of the things that we also looked at was procedures. And there are some procedures we get a lot of, some that are fairly rare. And we asked if they had ever had to forfeit a procedure to an MP or PA. And that one was looking at not necessarily the students, but just the MPs or PAs that were there. And there was, a, there was a fair amount of forfeiture of procedures, not everywhere. And what we found actually was great variety when you dive into some of the supplemental data, which I, I highly recommend anyone who's looking at this and, and you know, we welcome the, the details and critiques and such. We have over 30 pages of supplemental um, documentation here, which goes into all of those forfeited procedures and the, the study instrument itself. The whole thing is in, in the supplemental files. 
So, you know, it varied a lot. Some programs had a big problem. Some programs, the MPs and PAs did not interact with the residents at all. They were running a different wing of the emergency department. Uh, it, it really varied a lot. But in places where they had issues, they had big issues. And so we asked two dichotomous, very parallel questions of how do MPs and PAs in the ED help your education? And how do MPs and PAs uh, detract from the education? I was really surprised to see that on the help, about 60%, about two thirds of the respondents actually wrote that there was no, no benefit. They could not answer that question, that there was nothing they could say towards the benefit of having MPs and PAs in the ED, which is unfortunate on a, a lot of levels. Uh, but that number was was quite quite striking to me. It was disappointing to see, I, I think, the lack of ability of the programs to, you know, if you're going to have NPs and PAs in the ED, to ensure that there is some benefit from the multidisciplinary approach that, that emergency medicine is, is taking now. We asked them how they felt, is asking the residents, how confident they were that their local leadership, if they had any concerns, their local leadership could address these concerns without any retaliation. And a majority of them said no, that they did not feel comfortable approaching their local leadership. This is a majority across the country. So not just you know, at, at one institution or one shop, the majority of people from shops across the country said that this is an issue they did not feel comfortable bringing up their local leadership. So you know, the ACGME the, uh, is also important, right? This is a credentialing body for all residency programs and fellowships. And so we asked, how confident are you that the ACGME would be able to address any of your concerns now that this is part of the survey? And uh, two thirds of them said, no, they didn't think the ACGME would be able to satisfactorily address their concerns as well. So what that leaves us with is residents concerned, and this is their perspective, this is subjective, right? But I think this is an important question to ask, how do the residents feel about this? So the residents are in a position of feeling like their education is being compromised and they also don't feel like they can approach their local or national leadership to address the concerns. That's a problem. Uh, I think we all can agree, whatever, whatever political side of this fence you're on, I, I think we ought to be able to agree that if there's a concern of any major stakeholder, it needs to be heard, it needs to be addressed. And that's that's where we're at right now is we've identified one of the tough questions. How do we address this concern? We definitely don't have an answer to it. So to summarize what I've heard you say, you surveyed emergency residency programs across the country. You got a robust response rate. And what you discovered was that 67% of residents surveyed said that non-physician practitioners in the ER have had a detracting or greatly detracting impact on their education in part because of a loss of procedures, a significant loss of procedures, and further, that they do not feel confident that if they have concerns about the impact on their education or any uh, issue regarding those non-physician practitioners, they do not feel confident, most do not feel confident that their leadership at that facility or the ACGME is going to be able to address that. That's correct. Wow. You know, all of this is general and overall, right? We're talking two thirds here and one third there and one half. And, and if you're talking about the next question, the next question needs to be, what about the programs where they said the NPs and PAs helped their education? So there's something here. Uh, there's just a lot of variety and, and identifying which programs are able to make this work, I think is going to be number one to start aligning so that, that uh, these uh, practice models can be aligning in in a helpful way. No one should be having their education, the NPs and PAs as well. No one should be having their education negatively impacted. It's just interesting. I talk to a lot of people in academia and many or most, I would say that I talk to uh, ha have feelings about this topic, but are quite afraid to say anything publicly, they fear for their jobs. Did you have any concerns about that? Or do you have any concerns about releasing this information? What sort of pushback have you had, if any? I'm expecting and anticipating the online trolling and uh, derogative comments and such. I'm at a place with a group 
that agrees that research should be research and we should not be dissuaded from asking a question. So I'm, I'm grateful that I'm, I'm in that situation personally, as are the other authors here. But it took some time to find people who were willing to be derided for simply asking the question. And I have a real problem with that. I mean, somehow this is the, the medicine equivalent of religion and politics that you, you can't bring up at a dinner party. And we have to be asking these questions because we're talking about physician and NP and PA education. We're talking about patient safety is what we're talking about, because if these physicians, NPs and PAs aren't being properly trained, then patients are going to suffer. And if someone listening is wondering why it's a big deal that that a doctor is not getting enough procedures, when you're laying there and you need to have a procedure done, you better hope that the physician has done enough of them that they can competently take care of you. And that's the crux of this. Absolutely. And I would add to that, that I had, you know, this conversation sometimes with uh, residents who were feeling like, you know, I've done even 15 or 20, say, of of some particular procedure, and they're starting to feel good about it. It's not just knowing how to do the procedure. It's doing enough of these that you know what to do when things go wrong. Yeah, you can get the general sense of pretty much any non-surgical procedure after five, maybe 10 of these. But um you know, I tell, tell residents, for example, with the uh, central line, right, going in the neck, if you have not hit the carotid before, I'm not saying cannulate, but if you have not put the needle in the carotid, you haven't done enough. That's just after you do two, 3,000 of these, it's going to happen. And you have to know what to ha- what to do when that happens. You can read about it and you can practice with simulators and all these things, but there's no substitute for actually being in the moment. And you want to be in that moment in a place where you have people that are senior to you there to guide you and help you and make sure that you're successful so that the next time, if you're on your own, you really know how to handle it. And like you said, it may only happen one out of every several thousand times, which is the whole point of why residency is so long and the whole point of why we need those 15,000 hours, because in 500 hours, you're not going to probably see anywhere near the things that you need to see. Even in 15,000, there are things that we still wish we had had more exposure to in our training. Andrew, what do you hope comes from this study what do you would what would you like to see happen in the future and ongoing research i'd like to see a conversation about it i think the societies particularly uh, saam society of academic emergency medicine and core the council for residency directors in emergency medicine i hope they tackle this i hope the major society and certainly the major societies broadly but those are the education wings of, of emergency medicine I hope there are others who are willing to do the follow-up studies to ask the broader questions, the the broader survey of their residents who did not reply. I think we need to have a broader understanding of how the NPs and PAs feel about this. Without a doubt, people are going to be critiquing this, saying that it was aimed just to the physicians. And I want to make clear to people that we asked the residents because no one had, but someone needs to be asking the NPs and PAs as well, because I suspect that they're going to say they're not getting enough procedures either. And there's got to be a way that that all this can be aligned with the uh, intention of ensuring that everyone within their role in the emergency department gets the education that they need. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience? This is a concerning finding. If you if, if, if you're having a problem and you're unable to reach to your leadership about it, th- that's the crux of this. We have a problem. And we need to be able to make it so that the, the local leadership and the national leadership, the ACGME needs to step up without a doubt. So I hope people look at it, read it thoroughly. There's a lot to, to, to pull out of this. And I'm sure there are plenty of criticisms that can be there. Uh, but read the supplemental stuff. We really, there was nothing to hide. A lot of surveys will not give you the instrument. They don't give you all the response. It's all there. We not only presented all of the liquor scale items, liquor type items with their uh, median and standard deviation and such. We actually also gave the histograms so everyone can see the distribution. We we want this out there. We want this to be a conversation. We're not picking sides. We want people to just come to a, be able to have a conversation and come to a conclusion about it. That's what science is all about. And thank you so much for what you're doing, for advocating for the education of physicians and for all members of the healthcare team so that patients can get the right care. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew Phillips, for joining me. We will have the details of the article in the show notes. And if you'd like to learn more about this topic, I encourage you to get the book, Patients at Risk, 
and my sequel, Imposter Doctors. If you're a physician, I encourage you to join our group. It's called Physicians for Patient Protection. Our website is physiciansforpatientprotection.org. Thanks so much. We'll see you on the next podcast.